Hey friends, it's Alex from Vulture Culture, and this is the Roland Alpha Juno 2 from 1985. <laughs> The year is 1985, and Roland is on the run from Yamaha, who have released the DX7, an FM synth that is slaughtering the market. And they basically have three major lines of synths. They've got the Jupiter series, which is their high end, the Juno, which is their medium range, and the JX series, which is also kind of medium range, but features this sort of uh, knobless interface. So the Alpha Junos really aren't Junos in the way that you might think. They don't sound like the Juno 660 and 106 because the filter is different. But the oscillators themselves do sound pretty similar. Starsky Carr did a great video comparing the two. Check that out if you want. So what Roland did was try to create a synthesizer that could make sounds that were FM-like, uh, so more bell tones, more electric piano tones, stuff like that. And they did that by adding a bunch of new oscillator shapes that are all analog, uh, kind of unique to this particular synthesizer. And the filter isn't fully resonant like the Juno or Jupiter filter. But I pulled up uh, patch 55 here to illustrate that the filter's still capable of some pretty serious resonance, so. So as you can hear, that's pretty resonant. I know a lot of people like to hate on the Alpha Juno series because it really doesn't sound like a Juno. That's still pretty usable. And although you can't get certain sounds like using the filter as a third oscillator, it really is quite convincing overall what you can do with this. I've got a dead note here. <laughs> With this patch, you can hear this very complex envelope for the time. The way it opens, closes, and then reopens. Oof. Oof. You can hear how useful this would be for the techno guys. Surprisingly velocity sensitive after all this time. Little 
pizzicato action. Juno strings. That's that famous sound. I think there's a few reasons that people like to hate on the Alpha Junos. And one of them is just when you compare this in sheer size, it's hard to see on this camera, but it is by far the smallest of all the vintage synthesizers I have. I have about 12 of them in this room from the 80s. And this one just seems really small, but it's actually metal and feels really solidly built uh, compared to some of the other ones that are a little flimsier over there. Um, another reason is because of this modulation wheel. That works pretty well, but if you look, there's very little play this way. Adding a little bit of vibrato. Let's see if I can f pull up a better patch. So if I play a little lead. You can see there's a little bit of play in there, but it's pretty pathetic. And um, another reason, of course, is this alpha dial. So this showed back up on the JX10, and it is just people don't like using that sort of thing to program synthesizers anymore. It was a good way for Roland to save some money to make the actual analog synth better. This one's really nice. Loud piano? This sounds loud. little uh, harpsichord action. Chorus guitar. Does sound chorusy and kind of guitar-y, but it's got that cold thing to it. Organ one. <laughs> Very organy. Two. Very, very coursey. Cheesy organ. Chawa organ? Whoa. Ooh, vocorder. really does have a vowel-y type of sound to it. That's a really cool sound that I haven't heard on one of these vintage synths before. Now, a couple of things about this keyboard. One is it's got a really great key bed. It feels amazing for how old it is. And it's both velocity and aftertouch responsive, which for the time 85 was pretty good. The Alpha Juno 1 is the exact same internals, but it's with a 49 key bed without any velocity or aftertouch response. So it was kind of like an even more budget version, but I think it came out for approximately $420 in today's dollars. I mean, when you think about it, th this synth came out and it was cheaper than the Behringer DeepMind 6 back then, <laughs> which is pretty crazy. I think the fact that it was so cheap is a big reason why people like to hate on this little guy. It's quite capable. And of course, it's famous for a certain sound here. Let me go find it real quick. I think it's somewhere in here. Oh yes, uh, 86, this sound you might recognize. <laughs> The 
famous Hoover sound created by Eric Persing. So this sound has been used on countless records and it is just a very strange sound to have become so famous over the years. This patch might be modified or something because it doesn't actually remind me of the original Hoover sound or the way I, I think of it as a falling pitch most of the time. But on this one, it seems to be very slow. I don't know if that's, or maybe it's velocity is changing the speed. I don't know. It's a famous sound though. And it's uh, not called a Hoover, it's called what the, and the, and the story goes that Eric Persing got tasked to create more Hoover type sounds for the JV series. And he had to actually go look up what a Hoover sound was only to discover he had invented Sinusoidal. it. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. You hear that voice stealing. I love that one. I gotta remember that one. Fat synth. Oh, that's that sound. Too. This is a really cool sound. How you hit the key affects the resonance. I know that David Wise used one of these guys for the DKC2 soundtrack, and this reminds me a lot of the bassline sound from Sticker Brush Symphony. And again, <clears throat> I feel like I'm sort of sticking up for this underdog here, but listen to the resonance on this sound. I guess it's not technically fully resonant, but I think for most sounds, that's resonant enough, don't you think? Like that sound is mostly resonance. one pretty thick so i think what's crazy about the synth for me is that although it is an analog synth the oscillators are digitally controlled like the junos and so there's a sort of a stability to the sound that you get that you don't get from my other VCO synths like the Korg Poly 6. I get where people say that the synthesizer sounds more digital than the other Roland analog synths. And what that comes from, I believe, is the fact that we get a bunch of waveforms in the synthesizer that are thinner sounding. So it doesn't have the same warmth necessarily. Of course, the original oscillators are in there, but a lot of the patches are made with these more complex, harmonically rich, uh, cool waveforms. But what ends up happening is, is it doesn't have that familiar warm analog thing that we've all grown to love, like this brass patch sounds good but it doesn't exactly sound warm does it sounds kind of cold and without those vcos and, and of course the, the juno's digitally controlled oscillator synths too this sound has a little bit more warmth to it i think that's a little bit more what we'd all hope for Yeah, a little bit more warmth, but still that brassy character that's so uh, famous for the Roland filters. So I think what's really cool about the Alpha Juno 2 is that it has that brassiness that none of these other synthesizers have. There's a certain sort of uh, mid-rangey thing going on. When a 
really slap the velocity. That's that characteristic sort of Juno-y type sound. Ooh, that one's great. Really good articulation on this. It's like you could use it for chords. But you could also do really fast lines, you know. To be able to power through something if you needed. Bells. See, it really still doesn't sound like FME to me because I feel like the giveaway of FM or LA is always going to be a difference between the transient and the sustain. Whereas here, we're still feeding just a waveform through a filter. So you're always going to get that sort of consistency to it. Not that it's not beautiful, not, but it doesn't sound like a bell uh, compared to what was capable, what was possible at the time. Dispatch 73 bell chime. Very Stranger Things. It's got that brassiness to the filter. Oh, this is so cute. It's called Kodo, like the uh, Japanese instrument. Very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, just that it it is that thin thing that this synth is known for. And to me, it's almost like there's a high pass filter built into this thing, but I don't believe there is. Could be wrong if there was one built into it to explain a lot, but I think what it is is just that these waveforms are pretty thin sounding, or some of them are. Like I said, I think just the raw square and saw is basically the same sound as the Juno, but we get a bunch of other waveforms to start with, which can create these kind of uh, different types of sounds than any other Roland analog synth could do. This synthesizer also represents Roland's last attempt at a analog synthesizer. So what's interesting is we associate the 80s with analog synths, but really that's more the 70s and the early 80s. Um, a couple of things happened. One is in 83, of course, the DX7 came out. And so largely 60% of the music that came from that era is actually really more digital synth anyways. Roland, sort of the king of the analog synths, had to figure out what to do. And in 87, they released the D50, which was their LA uh, sort of all digital affair to compete with the DX7 and create these really realistic sounds by using short PCM sample transients to add some realism. Uh, and then basically virtual analog architecture underneath that. This is not technically their last analog synth as they did release the JX10 in 1986, the following year. But the JX10 is really two JX8Ps stacked on top of each other. It's basically got double the voices for a total of 12 voices. And it didn't represent a new way to think about synthesis the way the Alpha Juno 2 did. So the sort of critical difference is that we have a bunch of different types of waveforms now and different waveforms for the sub oscillator as well as for the regular DCOs. So it really is a unique piece of hardware and speaks to a certain time. And so it virtually was the last attempt at Roland creating a new paradigm of synthesis for 30 years until they came out with the Roland JDXI in 2015. So in essence, this was Roland's last shot at how to create captivating analog synthesis. Here's another one, Synthpress 2. Really just gives you that evocative sound. Nice little slap to it. And I appreciate how great this key bed feels in conjunction with this velocity. It's pretty expressive. Here's a kind of a DW8000D type sound. It's a lot of resonance there. 
Jesus. It's a lot happening. Wow. I'm guessing it's using multiple LFOs to create all of this, as well as envelopes. Like I said, the main criticism I hear about this guy is that the filter's just not resonant enough, and I don't know. I feel like that's pretty resonant. <laughs> So this is where this puppy just, just really sings or for these Juno string sounds. I could listen to that sound all day. I do feel like there's a lot that's been said about DCOs versus VCOs, which is better, which is worse. And playing this guy, I have to say, I miss the VCOs. I believe this is the only DCO synth I have, and it's a little rigid sounding. And I guess when I'm playing the Korg DW8000, which has digital oscillators and it's rigid sounding, I kind of expect it in a way. I guess I sort of feel like, okay, you know, they're they're not really analog oscillators, so they're not going to drift at all. And that just is, I've figured that out before I've started touching the keys. Playing this for the first time is kind of like... I mean, just if I hold this... I wouldn't say it's quite as predictable as the DW8000 because the DW8000 is really, really, it's like an LFO the way that those oscillators will clash with each other and create that pulsing, that beating. With this guy though, you've got at least the chorus, which sort of, and the same thing, I mean, the DW8000 has a chorus too, but this one's got that famous roll-in chorus. And the way it, it does sort of create this sort of movement um, but I, I just wish it had a little bit more. I think part of it is that it doesn't have two DCOs per voice. It's got the DCO and the sub, which is going to give you a different result than if you have two DCOs per voice. So you can get those to detune a little bit. And then you add the chorus on top, like you do with the DW8000. It's close, but... Uh... I mean, it's still beautiful, but uh, I want more. Ooh, this is nice and thick. Oh, dead key again. E piano two. Ooh, this is kind of a fantasy sounding thing. Little PWM. Pretty thick. So this is a good example of what I mean by... You can get these really thick sounds still. To me, that is a thick, Roland resonanced sound. But because there's so many of the presets that don't sound like this, you get this impression when you first turn the synth in, on that like, oh, this thing just can't do those sounds. But I mean, I think, I think they're here in spades, really. It's very thick sounding. So yeah, it's there. The, the sound is there. Ooh, here's some really weird ones. M71 machines. This is a pretty useful little sound effecty type thing. If you want to get some 80s video game sounds going, this one's called Takeoff. Off into the sky. <laughs> Oh, this one's called Dog's Bark. It's adorable. It doesn't really sound like a dog, but a little bit. <laughs> Fido. Okay, so this one's called Ooh Scary. 
Oh, it's like a cute little ghost. <laughs> little synth tom action. And uh, we'll final, we'll end with the Hoover sound. One more time. Just keeps going down. So that is the Roland Alpha Juno 2 from 1985. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and subscribe to the channel. It makes a huge difference. And I'll see you in the next video.